Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we're embarking on a beautiful journey into music theory. And um, this particular course of music theory has the added bonus that those of you who do not know how to read and write music, you will be able to learn that part as well. The first few videos in this series will deal specifically with writing and reading music. Okay, so you're asking me, why do we need music theory? Why do we need all this uh, nonsense of music theory? If I already know how to play my violin, as much as I know, uh, if I know how to play my little piano or my guitar and I sing with my guitar and so, why do I need to really further myself into music theory. Now, if you go to a college or university, you know exactly why. But those of you who are just wanting to take this for their own pleasure, why do I need music theory? Why do I bother with all this uh, theoretic stuff that many people have told me in the past, it's very difficult, it's very academic, and um, you, you really, really don't need it, all right? Well, I'm looking at a few things that my students over the years have uh, written uh, down when I asked them why they thought they needed music theory. And uh, mind you, they did this after they took the course. Um, you need to read music in order to make better music with more musicians, more complex music, etc. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Let's move on. You need to be able to play other composers' music. Well, that's kind of like, well, a, yeah, duh. How do you know how to play somebody else's music if you don't know how to read it because they have put it down on a piece of paper for you? So you need to be able to interpret that. That's very good. You need to understand the standard of music notation so you can have meaningful conversations with other musicians and speak the common musical language. That's a very, very important thing. I think we're driving here to the common musical language. Everyone has to speak the same language so we can make music together. Let's go on. You need to understand music, uh, how the music works in order to make the right music interpretation decisions and take your music making to the next level. That's also very, very important. How do you know how to make the right decisions about interpretation and how you um, want to play your piece of music and so unless you know exactly what the composers uh, composers put down on the piece of paper you have to be able to read it to really make sure that you're doing the right thing number one and number two make your own decisions about music interpretation that's very important um, you need to understand how composers make music and understand harmonic structure rhythmic structure organizational structure instrumentation orchestration and so on that's great, that's fine, that's exactly what we will try to uh, dive into um, as we go through this course. Someone said, you need to understand your solo instrument or vocal pieces in order to perform them better. That's very important. That kind of drives in, uh, kind of goes with what somebody else said before. But I like this one at the end. You need to um, learn to read music in, in order to get paid gigs and make money. Well, <laughs> yes, that's very, very true. And one more thing that I'm going to add, this comes from me. Um, students have not this put this in, but it comes from me, from what I have uh, experienced over the years. Music writing and, and reading really heightens your IQ. You're gonna be learning a new language Maybe it's not as difficult as learning a foreign language, like me, for example, learning Spanish. If I don't know Spanish and I want to be able to learn Spanish, uh, it's going to probably take me at my age, you know, roughly a year or two, if I immerse myself in, in that language. Uh, might not take you quite as long to learn the music notation language uh, because uh, it's not quite as, as, as difficult. Uh, but it will take a lot of practice. So imagine going down the road and uh, you're meeting some people and you want to know a little bit more about them 
and you ask them, uh, sir, can you please tell me what your IQ is? Hmm. Okay, my IQ is, you know, last time I tested myself, it was, uh, it gives you a nice no high number. And you say, oh, that's so great, uh, good, come into my camp. And you meet somebody else, sir, can you tell me what your IQ is? And it gives you another high number. Um, and you say, oh, beautiful, come into my camp. And you meet somebody else, gives you a lowish number or so, and you say, well, what's wrong with you, sir? Why are you not following Mr. Kazan on his uh, music theory uh, videos? Go and do it, and hide in your IQ. Uh, joking aside, it's really important to uh, know how to read and write music, especially if that's your interest. If you don't care too much about music and you want to stay at the level that you're right now, uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot say anything about that. Somebody once told me that Uncle Billy told them many years ago that he could play any tune out there with just two chords. And I said, well, can you show me, sir, what that means, you know, with just two chords, anything? So he said, yeah, I know how to play Happy Birthday with just two chords and listen to this because I don't, I think it's all fine. So you see, I can do, I can play happy birthday with just this note and this note in the left hand. Of course, I have to play the melody in the other, in the other hand, but I can just play C and G in the other hand and it sounds pretty good to me. Well, then the guy said, uh, yeah, that is very nice. I like your rendition, but I don't know how to do that. I, I just don't do that. And uh, I said, well, that's exactly my point, sir. My point is that if you knew a little more about music theory and harmony and how all this stuff works, you could make, you can make a better decision on how to harmonize your, your melodies um, for a nicer, fuller sound, more diverse, more, um, more rich in sonorities and so on. So now, we're going to go one step further than this. Imagine that your loved one sits right here next to you on the piano bench, and it's his or her birthday, and you decided you wanted to play happy birthday for her in a much, much better way, and let's see how that better way translates on the piano. You're going to put a lot more feeling into it. You're not going to rush through the notes. You want this moment to last for as long as possible while you play happy birthday for him or her. And uh, maybe you come up with something like this. Okay, so you guys see how Happy Birthday can be played in three different ways. You can play in a very basic way. That basic way tells me that you don't know too much about music theory, music harmony, you don't have the practice necessary, you don't have the musicianship that's necessary to play it properly. The second one was great, was good, was, was proper, all the chords are there, you know, much better performance. But the third one, I think, in my opinion as a musician, 
is that hit a lot of the, the, the right points, meaning that you took your time, it was a lot more musical, it, ha it had or, you know, uh, elements of improvisation that you throw in there, and it was so, so, so much well taken care of. Okay, so let's go a little further with our course here. The intention of this course, number one, will give you a solid understanding of the fundamentals of music. Music notation, pitch, rhythm, intervals, triads, seventh chords, and it's okay if you don't understand some of this terminology for now. We will go through this and you will, by the end of this course, know exactly what I'm talking about. This course is a great companion for the course that you will be taking at your local college or university. Um, it won't match exactly what you will be studying there. Of course, there's different teachers, different um, curriculum to go through. Some teachers have different ideas of how to structure the course and so. And some teachers just don't have the right time, um, all the time in the world to go through all this material that I'm going to go through with you guys. Okay. All right. So this course is really for the beginner, the person who has no experience with uh, music uh, reading or writing. But this person needs to be able to do the following. Number one, needs to be able to identify general characteristics of pitch, timbre, as well as the rhythmic patterns. So we're talking about somebody who has a little bit of innate talent to be able to uh, sing pitch, sing in tune, right? And uh, be able to identify rhythmic patterns. For example, if I go to the piano and I play this pitch, and I'm asking the person, okay, sir or, or ma'am, can you please sing it back to me as best as you can with, with, the, with the proper pitch and so. And they don't know how to do that. You know, we're probably going to have a little bit of a, a, a problem. So if I play this pitch, I'm expecting somebody to sing it back and say, bam, at the right pitch, okay? If not, something is wrong. Also, if I start playing a couple of um, very simple patterns here, maybe something like this. They should be able to sing. So, the person needs to be able to play back or sing back that uh, simple pattern. It has to be done in tune, all right, so uh, no out of tune stuff. I should be able to recognize it immediately. Um, and also this person should be able to retain and sing back simple to more complex musical phrases. The best part of this course, and this is really very important here, is that it's completely free of charge. You guys don't have to pay tuition. You do not have to send me any money and say, hey, here's 20 bucks for this course or anything. No, completely free of charge. Um, the only problem with this course is that I will not be able to correct your homework and look it over in a personalized way. In other words, if I give you some homework and want you to work on it for a week, you will not be able to send it back to me and say, can you please correct it for me? Can you please look it over, make sure that I'm, I'm doing a, the right thing here? So that's the only problem that we're going to have. So no, no uh, feedback. Also, I won't be able to uh, give you a midterm exam or a final exam and give you a final grade or um, actually t tell the music faculty, yes, this person is able to pass the course because they've done all the work. So you'll still have to be enrolled in your school, pay your tuition, and do the classwork. Go to class, <laughs> take all your notes, make sure that what that teacher is asking you you're, you're doing. So that's very important. Okay, so now let's look in detail of what this course, course is going to be about. Enough talk about general stuff. Um, let's look at a few very, very important things here. Number one, music notation and reading music, pitch and rhythm. This is for the beginner again. If you already know how to read music and you feel comfortable, very comfortable about that, feel free to skip these introductory videos. 
all the videos about music notation, you can skip them. That's fine. But for those of you who, who cannot skip them, this is what we're going to go through. Pitch writing and altering the pitches with accidentals. If you don't know what accidentals are, that's fine. You're going to find out. No duration values and combining values in different ways. Using the metronome. Okay, Your metronome is going to be your best friend. I have a metronome that's always on my iPhone and all my Android phone, actually. Um, but I have another ad, uh, iPhone that has the metronome so that I can put it in front of my students and uh, don't get all the notification from calls and stuff like that. Uh, it's always there as a, as a single entity, the metronome. Um, metronomes are free right now to download, and I will tell you when we get there w which one I use, the one I prefer to use. Um, we're going to learn all about dynamics and what those things are and on other performance markings. You're going to learn about second, first and second endings, the repeat signs, and all that stuff. Um, next, after we're done with music reading, okay, we're going to go into one huge topic called intervals. The intervals topic is going to be so important, and you have to think about intervals as being the building blocks of music theory. If you do not understand intervals very, very well, you're not going to understand more complex stuff like triads, seventh chords, and so on. Okay, So make sure that when we get to the intervals, you are all 100% in there, paying attention, doing all the homework that I give you so that you understand them very well. They're also a lot of fun, too. There's a lot of calculating and looking, but I want to see how quick you can get to resolving all the questions about intervals that I'm going to put in the homework for you. So very, very important. Intervals, very, very important topic. Do not skip that topic. That's very important. After I think you have the intervals really well down under your belt, I'm going to go into the system of scales. Okay? I think in order to study scales, you really need to know about a few very, very important intervals. That's why I'm putting the intervals first, and then I'm going into the system of scales, both major and minor scales. We might touch a little bit upon the modern modes, okay, uh, but not too much. Not too many composers uh, use these modes these days, um, and uh, they're really not so important unless you want to study the music of the Renaissance and the Baroque, the early, very early Baroque period, and how modes really evolved into scales. However, we'll probably mention them. I will explain how they work and so, but they're not going to be very, very um, uh, important to, uh, to our discussion in music theory. Um, you're going to be learning about key signatures, very, very important, and about the circle of fifth. That's going to be a big topic. We're going to lay it out really nice with charts, and um, we're going to see graphically and visually how the system of scales works based on the circle of fifth. Very nice and important. After that, after we're done with this, we're going to move into triads. Triads are extension of the intervals concept, uh, meaning that instead of having two notes like this, that's an interval, by the way, two notes at a time. And, uh, you know, for example, this. Okay, I'm playing pitch E and G together, and they form a third, the interval of a third, and that happens to be a minor third, all right? And you'll see exactly why. But when we move to triads, we're going to add yet another note, and for example, this. Hmm, so we add another third on top of that third that created this triad. That sounds a lot better, a lot fuller. You have three notes right now to listen to instead of just two. And we can create chords out of triads. Actually, the triad is a three-note chord. And we're going to talk about all permutation of triads and qualities and inversions and all that stuff. Very, very nice. When we're done with triads, we're going to go into seventh chords. Seventh chords are even more complex because we add yet another note to into the mix. And let's say that we, uh, our chord right now is going to sound like this. 
Ooh, so much more complex, right? Coming from this to this. So you're adding this note up on top, okay? And now our possibilities are multiplying exponentially. You know, before working with triads with three notes, we could only do one, th you know, a certain number of permutations. Now that you have four notes, you have quite a few more and you'll learn about all those things. You'll learn about this one in particular, which I love all the time. This is one. That sounds so nice, right? By the way, that's called a dominant seventh chord. And we'll see exactly why it's called like that in the next chapter, which deals with functional harmony. Functional harmony is taking all these triads and seventh chords that we've learned so far and applying them into a particular key, all right? And all these triads and seventh chords are all of a sudden taking functions, taking roles that they play in that particular key, okay? And we're gonna talk about tonics and dominants and leading tones and supertonics and medians and subdominants and all that stuff, all of that terminology that musicians use when they talk about music modulating to a different key by using the dominant seventh chord, for example, or common tone modulation or anything like that. So functional harmony is very, very important and really kind of puts everything in perspective musically. You take triads and seventh chords, you put them together in the context of a key, now you end up with all these functions that these chords have in the key. That's when we talk about functional harmony. After we talk about functional harmony, we're going to dive into four-part writing, S-A-T-B. That means soprano, al alto, tenor, bass. And there's lots and lots of rules and regulations that we have to do just to make sure that that writing really sounds good. We'll learn all, that, all about that, too. Then, when we're done with that, we're going to do some basic mu music analysis of four-part writing. All right, so... We know how to arrange things, how to put things in four parts and so. Now let's look at how other composers have done it. We're going to look at uh, the composers from the Baroque period and how they've done it prior to Mr. Johann Sebastian Bach, which was the father of all four-part writing out there. Um, we're going to take a few you know, simple chorales and see how other composers prior to him have arranged for four parts, but then we're going to do some more, uh, more analysis, more complex, after we learn about the non-chord tones. Okay? Non-chord tones are those tones that really don't belong to the chord, um, but they do something in between these chords. They tie these chords together, um, and they, uh, they make the music more, more uh, interesting you know, by adding certain elements that really don't subscribe to one particular chord. Uh, when we have those under our belt, we're going to look at some more four-part writing by Mr. Johann Sebastian Bach. So, when we're done with our more complex four-part writing, I'm going to throw you another curve here, and we're going to learn a little bit of, uh, about other clefs. We're going to be concentrating primarily up to this point uh, on the um, uh, treble and bass clefs. Mainly, mainly the grand staff writing. Um, but now I'm going to throw in a couple more clefs, and there's quite a few of them there out there. Uh, the main one, uh, other than the two I just mentioned, are going to be the alto clef. Uh, there's one particular instrument in the orchestra today that still uses that clef almost exclusively, and those are the violists. The violists are basically... Um, Viola is an instrument basically between the violin and the cello, okay? So they have kind of special requirements um, when it comes to range and, and finding a clef that works really well with the kind of range that they can, they can uh, play on the, uh, on the viola. So uh, you'll learn about the alto clef or the viola clef as we call it, um, which is a sort of a, uh, it, it, it's one version of the C clefs, as we call them, you know, and some other ones too. Next, we're going to talk about the orchestral instruments and their ranges. 
what can the oboes do, what can the clarinets do, the bassoons, um, and some other instruments like, uh, you know, trombones, French horns, and all that, the, the brass instruments. And I'm going to be playing excerpts for you guys from, from famous orchestral works that highlight these specific instruments so you can hear exactly their timbers and, and, and how they work really well with other instruments in the orchestra. Okay, you'll also notice that some of these instruments are transposing instruments, meaning that they don't play at concert pitch. Meaning that, for example, in the case of the trumpet, if the trumpet part writes in C, that's why, for example, write a part in C major for the trumpets, their part actually does not sound in C, but it sounds one whole step lower. So if I write in C and they play C on their trumpet, this comes out. Now you go to the piano and say, well, that's not a C, that's a B flat. Well, that's because the trumpet is a transposing instrument and we have to transpose everything up a whole step if we want them to play at concert pitch. All right? So if you have a piece that's written in A major, three sharps, and you want the trumpets to be able to play that piece correctly in that key, you have to write their part in B major, which has five sharps. Okay, whoa, that's a mouthful right there. Well, you'll learn exactly how that's done. Of course, we're going to read about, we're going to learn about reading an orchestral score, right? Um, we're going to look at all the instruments at once and see how they are arranged um, and, and on the score so you can make sense of all of them quickly. You have to remember that some of them are transposing. When you look at their pitch, you have to, in your head, transpose, because that's very important. When we're done with all that stuff, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to introduce you to the notions of counterpoint. Counterpoint is the art of writing two or more independent parts that really go nice together. All the major composers out there have written counterpoint. Counterpoint is so important to have at least two independent lines going together that harmonize beautifully, but they still are interesting enough for both players to, to, uh, to perform. First of all, we're going to look at some two-part inventions by Bach. Two-part inventions were written as study in uh, simple counterpoint. So you get the idea. Some, uh, you know, beginning two-part inventions are a little less difficult for, for the youngsters. Some of them are a little more difficult and some of them don't really attempt to play the more difficult ones because Bach is it's starting to employ some different and more difficult motives and things like that that require more, uh, more dexterity and more experience to play. After we look at these simple two-part inventions, we're going to analyze them, we're going to go through them and see exactly what Bach is doing in these inventions. We're going to go to a much larger and more complex form of the Baroque period in which counterpoint is used called the fugue. Now, fugues can start basically at three parts. You can have a three-part fugue, you can have a four-part fugue, you can have as much as six or seven or even eight parts we're not going to look at anything quite as complex as that, even though Mr. Bach has, has some of those in his repertoire. We're going to probably look at a, a three-part fugue or a four-part fugue. Let's see how, how I feel at that point and how, um, how much you guys are, you know, through the comments and everything that I'm getting, how um, well you're following me up to this point. And uh, as a graduating exercise, at the end of this entire course, I'm going to ask some of you, those who are still with me, to write your own exposition of a fugue. And I promise you this time, if we make it that far and I see interest, I will look at every single one that you guys submit back to me. Um, we might be also be looking at some harmonic analysis of orchestral music. I think that's important. Um, you'll be able to look at a score and understanding it at that point, and uh, you should be able to uh, do some 
harmonic analysis at that point of orchestral music. Uh, music basically from the classical period. I'm not going to push anything uh, you know, from the romantic period or beyond on you on that. Just from the classical period. Probably something by Beethoven or Mozart. Estimated duration for learning all this. Well, in a college university, if you don't read music and they accept you there, you probably can go through this course in about two years to two years and a half. I'm not going to take that long to create this vid video, so I'm going to go a little quicker, but I'm not going to expect you guys to follow me on this. But if you already know how to read and write music, probably about two years, I would say. A typical college course in music theory, you know, takes about two years. I don't know exactly how they structure it. Um, theory 101, Theory 102, and then you go to Theory 201, Theory 202, depending on, you know, the year change, so and it starts with two. I'm not sure exactly how, how it's going to be structured at your, your local college or university, but, you know, pretty much there. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of uh, ear training concepts here. You will notice that up to this point, a lot of the things were theoretical, but also practical. One simple concept or one simple thing that you'll be doing in uh, ear training is, for example, I give you this pitch A, okay, and I'm going to ask you to sing a major third down without any other help. I just gave you the, the reference note, A440, and I'm going to ask you to sing a major third down. If you come back to me and you sing this, bum, so you heard, bum, ah, good, then you're right, all right? And we're going to listen to a lot of examples of this and how you actually fine tune your, your hearing of pitch to be able to gauge the, diff, the distance between, you know, the reference note and the uh, interval that I'm asking you to, uh, to sing. Also, um, we're going to be doing uh, intervals, all kinds of intervals, not just thirds, you know, any intervals so you're going to have to identify and sing them back if I just give you one reference, uh, one reference note, which is usually A440. We're going to be listening to triads next uh, and then seventh chords, so things are going to get a lot more complex and more difficult and so on. And to top it all out, you know, when you have all these uh, under your belt, we're going to be doing some um, simple rhythmic dictations, some r simple pitch dictations, and then we're going to combine the two of them into, you know, something more complex. Dictate music dictation is usually the pinnacle of all your training. That's when you actually listen to everything that's being presented for you. You know how it sounds, and you can write it all out. Okay. Preparing for the course. How do I prepare for this course and uh, so I can better make, uh, make use of my time and everything when I study all these things? Number one, pick an optimum time to watch the videos free of distraction. Okay? Some of you are night owls. You like to study at night when everybody's gone to bed. That's when you come out of your den and you flourish and you do your stuff. That's fine. Me, on the other hand, I'm more of a day person, come 10 o'clock or something, I'm done and I want to go to bed. Um, so for me, watching videos during the day makes more sense. Um, print music paper and keep it organized. Very important. I'm going to put some links on the bottom of this uh, video to uh, some free music paper that you can download from the internet and print, and print lots of them. You know, uh, probably going to be going to using uh, tens and tens of sheets of paper. If you make mistakes, you can just throw the one out and print, uh, you know. You can also use a pencil to write, so you can erase. That's up to you. Some people just don't like those um, pencil, you know, bits and pieces that uh, are left behind on the paper. So what they do, they write with a pen and they just throw out the music paper. You can also print as you go. You don't have to print everything at once. Be prepared to take notes and pause and rewind the videos. That's very important. I, that goes without saying. I know you guys can figure that out um, 
automatically, I don't have to tell you. Be prepared to perform the exercises recommended. Very important. I will be giving you access to um, my library of PDF files that I've created over the years with exercises specifically for the uh, videos that we're going to go through. And uh, for that, you're going to need, again, to print them out, work them on the paper. Uh, and then maybe after a week or two after presenting them or letting you do the homework, I'm going to present you with a, with a solution sheet, meaning that you will have the opportunity now to compare what you did and what I did and see if you've done anything wrong. That's great. Um, Try to gain access to a keyboard instrument, preferably a piano that's kept in tune. You need some kind of a keyboard instrument at home. Um, it doesn't have to be a grand piano like this, beautiful and, and shiny and in tune and, and, uh, and uh, uh, expensive. <laughs> um, you might already have an upright piano at home. Make sure you get it tuned. That'd be great if you get it tuned. Or you can also purchase a keyboard instrument that's not too expensive, doesn't take too much space in your uh, in your uh, living room or wherever you want to put it. And uh, the advantage of that is that you can plug in your earbuds or your headphones and practice your, your, your listening to, to this uh, quietly without disturbing anybody at home. You can also practice your piano pieces if you, if you are a pianist or you like to play the piano. This course does not cover absolutely everything there is to know about music theory. Uh, and I don't think there's a course out there in the world that does. It's uh, almost impossible. Um, but this course will definitely give you an excellent foundation on which to build uh, your, your music making for many, many years to come. So it's, it's really nice to, uh, to know that something like this exists out there and it's free of charge and uh, you can do it at your own pace. Next, I hope this will excite you to continue studying music and discover the many other facets of music making, keep you focused and engaged in making music. And with this, I'm really going to wrap it up for you guys, because this video took already way too much of your time. Um, I hope you got a lot of information out of it, and this gives you enough information to base your decision to follow the course or not. Um, Feel free to ask me questions uh, down below in the uh, comments area. Um, but most of all, if you decide to take the course or if you want to just occasionally drop in and see what videos I've done, I want you to subscribe to the channel. Hit the subscribe button right underneath this, uh, this video and uh, maybe hit the notification bell as well, which uh, will notify you when I have a new video out and uh, you might wanna check it out. So with this, I want you guys to uh, stay safe, stay healthy, because that's important. If you have those two things, you can follow the courses. If not, you can't. So stay safe, be healthy, be good. I'll see you in the next video as we start talking about music theory. Thank you so much.